So, good morning everybody. Sorry for the delay. It started for the first, uh, very first uh, day of this course with, with technical problems. Don't ask me why. We used the same equipment <laughs> in the last semester. And yeah, it worked. Now I, I can't see anything. It, is, it seems a little bit different than <laughs> uh, last year. Very warm welcome to Mixed Signal Electronics in the semester 2010-2011. Let me introduce the team of this course. Here you can see Professor Schmidt Lanzidl, who is our boss and who is at the very end responsible for this course. This is me. I will give this course this year for the third time at TUM. It will be the fourth time at our joint program in Singapore, where we have the same course for a master uh, course together with the Nanyang Technological University in Singapore and TUM here. And on the right hand side you can see Michael Lüders who helped me a lot here in fixing all these problems. And he will be your lecturer and advisor in the tutorials. So, what do you get from us as support for this course? Of course you get this lecture here. After the lecture you get the tutorials given by Michael. Then we have a uh, big online support which means that this course is recorded and then available in the internet so if you did not understand something want to see it again or for the case that you were not uh, able to to join this course you can you can also uh, watch it online however my recommendation is that you take part here in the lecture because then also it is it is quite early then you spend this time uh, directly with uh, the mixed signal stuff and you have the, the chance to ask questions directly and are here with your friends and colleagues. I, I guess it's a much better atmosphere than sitting only at home in front of the PC. Then you get also the annotated slides after the lecture for download. Well, I get often asked why don't you provide the slides in advance. Well, the reason is that the slides are quite empty right now and I write most of the stuff during the lecture, so it's not very valuable to have the slides in advance, but I will give you the, the annotated slides after the lecture when all the, the topics and the content is on them. How can you ask questions that you might have during the course? Well, we try to use a forum in this course where you can ask questions online. I receive usually many emails with people asking uh, the same questions, so we decided to use this forum. This gives other students the chance to see your questions. Maybe they get their questions already answered in this forum, so we can, we can collaborate here and work together. Your questions can teach others or you may even want to, to answer the questions on your own, which gives you uh, probably deeper insight than if you, if you just, uh, just join the, the course passively. This is the administratives. Still, of course, you can, you can reach me uh, by email. Well, some, some words for my person, I work uh, full-time in industry and part-time as a lecturer at TUM, which means that I can provide you both the academic view on, on this topic, but also industrial perspective because I work directly in the, in the field of mixed, uh, of mixed signal in, in Finian. So this means, on the other hand, that I'm not available all the time in the, in the office here. So if you want to meet me for some questions, then you can arrange a meeting. The fastest way will probably be to, to send me an email and the best way will be to use the forum because then we can, as I explained, we can, we can share this information. Similar situation holds for, for Michael. He works at least part-time in Texas Instruments. So he will also not be available all the time here. So if you want to meet Michael, of course this is possible, but uh, then you should also arrange a meeting 
uh, by mail in advance. Otherwise, it it may be disappointing if you if you show up in his room and he's not there all the time. This does not mean that he does not work. So, <laughs> okay. The exam will be at the end of the course. I checked the timetable of the faculty, and what I saw is um, February 15th. I hope this is correct. But please uh, double check this this day, the couple of weeks before the exam, to make sure that nothing has changed. So we also tr track this and uh, will update you. The exam is in written form, so you get. We can. I, I think we can. Michael, we can say this. We we have usually three questions for all, all the main main chapters of this course. Um, it is open book, so you can bring everything you want, your slides, your lecture notes, you can uh, use books, whatever you want, except computers. Okay, Computers and phones is the only thing we, we do not accept, but everything else is, is acceptable. You already uh, saw it, the, the language here is English, I hope this is not a problem for you guys. Um, I get often asked, uh, is it possible to ask a question in German? Yes, of course you can ask a question in German. Then I will try to, to explain the question again and I will, I will answer in English. I also get the question, what about the exam? Can we write down uh, answers to the questions in German? Well, the official language is English. We will not uh, refuse to understand a German answer. but. You know, official means that we cannot guarantee that we can uh, that we can correct exams in any language because yeah, we can we can accept the languages that we understand, uh, but no others. And so the the official regulation is is English, but I promise that we will also accept German questions and and German answers during the exam. So what I forgot is, of course, there is uh, lecture notes for this for this course, and you can get the lecture notes in the Fachschaft for Elektrotechnik and Informationstechnik. They will sell it. Well, um, we got also uh, the question in advance: Why don't you sell the the lecture notes here um, in the in the course? What we did during the last courses? Well, the the basic answer is. The, the price of the of the Fachschaft is much more attractive, so they can they can uh, print it much cheaper than if we go to a, to a copy shop or to a professional printer. Okay, that's basically the administratives. So my quest first question of to, for you is: Do you have any questions, concerns, comments that you want to give? Well, the style of the, the course is that I ask a lot of questions, so <laughs> I really appreciate if, if you guys um, uh, take part in this course actively. So don't be afraid if something uh, that might come into your mind or that you, you want to say or a question that you want to answer, maybe not correct. This is, this is not a, a problem here. but. I think it's um, you, or you can learn best if you participate really actively. Okay, so the first thing as a motivation for this course is that I want to discuss the question with you, why do we need mixed signal and what is mixed signal basically? Well, if you go through the sh shops or if you look at all these gadgets that you use, and uh, you have your laptops, you have your, your computer, you have your cellular phones, with what, uh, whatever you use for, for instance, also your, your gaming gadgets or whatever, then if you look at this stuff, then you see it, everything is more or less digital. It has a digital processor inside and you can program it like a computer and it's basically a digital device inside. 
this is valid for more or less everything. So I have a very small list here. You can say, okay, this refers to all this communication stuff. It refers to your computer, to the multimedia stuff that, that you use. But it also refers to quite hidden devices. And hidden means, for instance, all these digital processors in cars, in, in devices that you use where you are usually not aware that there is a, a processor inside, but your dishwasher and, and stuff like that, of course, also has, has digital control. So all the, the control applications are also digital. Then if you think about mixed signal, then yes, it's mixed. So of course it contains uh, some digital devices, but well, the question is, what is the other part? So uh, probably it's analog. So the question is, in such a digital world where everything is digital, why do we need this analog stuff? Well, let's discuss the question, what is the environment of these digital systems? And if you look at the physical quantities that interact with your digital system, then you end up with a list that might look like this. For instance, you have everything that is mechanical. You have mechanical forces. You may have a position. You may measure motion or acceleration of any mechanical device. You might also have a device that measures light or a device that a sensor for electromagnetic field. You might measure the temperature, you might uh, use your sense organs, and all this stuff is in principle analog. Okay? The digital representation of the system is somehow a mathematical abstraction that says, okay, we quantize the time and we quantize the values. But if you look around here, you don't see a quantized time. Time is purely continuous. And at least all the macroscopic stuff is also not quantized in, in the values. So we have an analog environment. And also it is attractive to use digital devices for so many reasons, like robustness, like programmability, the ability to store information, to reconfigure the system, to have a very robust system at very against many many aggressors like noise, like against variation, and so on and so on. Also, we have all these advantages. We need the ability to interact with the analog, with the analog environment. And this is the field of mixed signal, because the field of mixed signal nowadays is basically to build a bridge between this analog environment and the digital signal processing part in our systems. And building this bridge means that we have a device that we call an ADC, an analog to digital converter. And this ADC is the input port from the analog environment into, into our system. But it also means that we have an output port and this is the so-called digital to analog converter. And this digital to analog converter is the output of the digital system. So you can say the mixed signal stuff is a shell around the digital system that is the sense organs and the actuators uh, for this digital system. Well, you might say there is also real digital interfaces of digital system. A good example is, for instance, if you look at your processor in your computer and your hard disk drive. Then in between there is a cable. Both devices are pure digital device. But you would be surprised if you put a scope and probe what comes out of your cable at, at the end of this 30 centimeter. If you would do this, you would say, see that this is basically an analog signal that comes out there. So even if the interface is digital and the function 
on a higher protocol level is digital, the, phi, the physical interface ends up to, to be an analog device. So again, we need these two guys here, the ADC and the DAC, to, to really interface the signal. If we look at this a little bit more in detail, then we can break down more or less each system according to this scheme. Assume that we have here in this yellow box an integrated device. And before we enter this integrated device, there may be an analog pre-processing and after leaving this device there may be an analog post process. So most of the things we discuss here in this course refer to integrated solution, to chip design of mixed signal systems. However, it is the course tries to be more general. Also the focus is on integrated solutions. All the things you learn here are basically also applicable for discrete solutions or what is much more important for me uh, is it should be valuable for users of such devices. So you will see we have a chapter on the on the performance figures of ADCs and, and DACs. This is usually the chapter that uh, students uh, believe is the most boring one. But this is also one that is very important if you want to build PCBs or if you want uh, foreign data converters and you go to any of these these shops in in munich and want to buy an adc so it is important that you understand the performance figures which is much more than only the resolution of such a device in order to choose the most appropriate one for your application what my goal is here that you really understand what is written in the data sheets uh, if you are choosing such a device. Okay, but that's the reason why we especially focus on this integrated part and after entering the chip, let's assume there is a pad and there is a pad, then there might still be some analog pre-processing and post-processing. But then very quickly we end up with the ADC Then we are in the digital domain. We can do all the digital processing of our signal. And if the processing is finished, then we convert it back with a DAC into the analog domain. So you might say we can build a system by choosing an ADC chip, which is a purely analog device. And then we might uh, take a processor connected to this ADC and to do this in two different chips. Of course, this is a solution. However, the trend in industry is going towards so-called SOX, system on chip. So the trend is to integrate more or less all functionality where you have a chance uh, that, you ha that you can catch and, and you put everything in, into this chip. There are several reasons for this. Well, one is of course cost. If you have one die in contrast to, to 10 chips, then the system is probably much cheaper. The other reason is that you can build much more compact devices because the footprint of a one or two chips on your board is much smaller than if you have a whole bunch of different chips that you have to connect on the board. And of course, the less devices you have on your board, the more reliable and robust your system is. Okay? If you have 10 devices, then the probability that one, one uh, solder bump uh, is damaged or gets damaged during the lifetime of the system is, is much higher than you have only one device with a few connections to, to the outer world. So, strongly related to mixed signal is always the point that we have a device that processes both analog and digital signals. And this is very often nowadays the case that these two signals are processed on a single chip. And this brings us some challenges that we also want to discuss in, in this course. 
we can look at this a little bit more in detail again then you might say here there is a analog input signal that is measured by any sensor and the important point here is we have continuous time and we have continuous values on the previous slide we had a device that was called ADC which interfaced the analog signal with the processor and at the output of this ADC we are discrete in time and we have also discrete values if we look at this structure here then you can see that in usual implementations we separate this A to D conversion into two steps first we have to sample the signal and in a sec then we have a continuous signal with on a discrete time axis and then we do the next step which means that we translate the continuous values to discrete values and this is this discretization step by the way here if we do it appropriately this sampling does not waste information if we do it appropriately however the discretization the mapping of a continuum of values onto discrete values this causes some error and this error is a quantization error so we have a loss of information here in the discretization so I'm sure you heard all or all of you heard some signal processing courses so what comes into your mind if we talk about sampling what is this Nyquist that we achieved the Nyquist criterion is the most important stuff and from a technical perspective what does it mean what is required uh, to, to fulfill this yes we need a low pass filter so the Nyquist criterion states that the sampling frequency must be high enough we will see in, during this course that it is reasonable not to choose the Nyquist frequency of twice the bandwidth exactly but a little bit more for implementation reasons but the basic requirement is that your signal is band limited so very often signals are not band limited so we need a filter to make a not band limited signal band limited so this is a low pass filter an anti-aliasing filter that we have to add before or in front of the ADC then as discussed here we have our digital signal processing and then we go out with the deck here what we will do during this course is that we follow this signal chain not step by step because for some didactical reasons and because the decks are easier to explain and to understand than the ADCs but basically we will discuss all the elements in the signal chain so we will start with sample and hold circuits and then after the sample and hold circuits we talk about so-called switch capacitor circuits switch capacitor circuits is a very interesting class of circuits because it's somehow in between the analog pure analog circuits and digital circuits you know digital circuits are discrete both in time and in the values on the other hand the analog circuits are continuous in time and the values and the switch capacitor circuits are already discrete in time but the values are still continuous so it's something in between but it is uh, something that is very often used uh, to implement precise analog analog functions and you will see what advantages these circuits have 
then we will have a chapter about data converter fundamentals. This is the chapter that I, I mentioned before, where I want you to learn and to understand all these, all these performance figures that describe an ADC or a DAG. After that, we will look at the actual implementation of DA converters. After that, we will look at the implementation of ADC converters. And if we say Nyquist DAGs or Nyquist ADCs, then this simply means that in this case, the sampling frequency is near to the Nyquist frequency. So usually we don't use the Nyquist frequency directly, but we take two, four, eight times the Nyquist frequency. And if the sampling frequency is like this, then we call this a Nyquist rate converter. On the other hand, there is the class of oversampling converters that will be uh, the last chapter in this course. And this class of oversampling converters refers to devices that have a sampling frequency that is much, much higher than the Nyquist frequency. So 64 times the Nyquist frequency, 128 times the Nyquist frequency, or even more. In this case, we can build uh, converters that have very coarse quantizers. For instance, one example is a converter here where we can build 16-bit ADCs out of a single bit quantizer. So somewhere in your system you have a comparator that only checks is my actual signal positive or negative. So you might ask how can I get 16 bits out of this? Well the point is that we do this so fast and in such a sophisticated fashion that we can trade time resolution against uh, this uh, voltage resolution and therewith we can build uh, very precise uh, data converters. However, the price is that we have to be very, very fast. That's why the sampling frequency is so high and that's why we call these converters oversampling converters. There is a good textbook. I think we somewhere have it. <laughs> it was a little bit chaotic this morning because of all these Beamer problems. Um, this is the textbook of uh, David Johns and Ken Martin that we have several times also in the library. So, to, to say it clearly, for passing the exam with a good, good grade, for understanding the stuff here in the course, you don't have to buy a book. If you want to use a book, because if you like another style of explanation because you prefer reading or whatever, you can borrow or buy a book and this book is the one that we have used to make the concept of this course. Okay, so this is a book that we can really, uh, that we can really recommend. Of course, there is other textbooks. No, uh, first, of course, you don't have to read the complete book. It's quite <laughs> quite a thick one. There's much more information in it. That's why it is also called Analog Integrated Circuit Design. So I, I put you here a list of chapters that is relevant for this course. We also have a list of other textbooks. These textbooks refer um, or some of them refer not to the complete course, but to special chapters. So one book I really like for all these figures of merit and performance figures is this book of Ratsavi, Principle of Data Conversion Systems. This is a book that I can recommend especially for the, for the chapter um, on the data converter theory. Then another one that I put here into this list for the first time, which is also a textbook that comprises more or less all the stuff we discuss here in this course, uh, is the CMOS analog circuit design. This is uh, the favorite book of, of Michael. So it's also, yeah, it it's depends on personal favorites, <laughs> what, what, what kind of explanation you prefer. But it's a very, very good book. And then, there is for other chapters also uh, some other books you can see here. The Delta Sigma uh, stuff has two references. Um, for sure, this is uh, books that go very deep into the details, much deeper than, than uh, 
the content of this course. So this is more or less a reference if you want to dive in deeper into these subjects then you can use this list. Okay. Slowly we start really with the with the technical content of this stuff. So the question here is what is the constraints if I build mixed signal systems on a single die? So this is a uh, table that compares especially mixed signal circuits in SOX. Well, the advantages is of course you can build nowadays huge digital systems on a very very small piece of silicon so you can enhance or flavor your analog circuits with some digital assist techniques. You may implement some digital post-processing or some digital calibration or some digital tuning functionality nearby your analog circuits in order to overcome analog impairments. For instance, uh, we will discuss the pipeline ADC and in the pipeline ADC we see, okay, there is algorithm for conversion of analog signals into digital ones and this algorithm has somehow problems if we have variations in comparator thresholds or we have if we have variations or uncertainty in gain elements and in this case we we can say okay we accept that there is this uncertainty but we add a digital post processing which is a type of redundancy or we might add a digital calibration so that even with these analog impairments we have a good overall system performance then it is an advantage of, of system on chip that you can combine, as I explained, the digital uh, processing directly uh, with the analog one. It is a big advantage that you have usually fast reference clocks there. So you have usually a very precise and fine time basis and you have very fast, now this very, very fast uh, digital gates for for the processing of all of this and of course if you implement a big part of your system with in or in a digital style then you have all these advantages of digital system to emphasize one it's quite difficult to store information in an analog way it's more or less trivial nowadays to store information in a digital way and stuff like this one point that is important, I, I will not explain this uh, now because this occurs all the time in this course, robustness for instance. As soon as you are analog, you have to, to cope with some, some variation stuff and this is something that is also a topic in the, into the digital world but much less important than for analog. So what we can learn from here, probably the combination of both worlds is, is the best and therefore you have to, to have an understanding of both worlds in order to say okay this I make analog, this I make digital and then I combine it like this and then it's best. However, this also has some challenges because if you look into your analog textbooks and you see your uh, basic transistor equations and then if you go into your spy simulators with modern transistors then you will be surprised that uh, modern transistors more or less do not behave uh, like these models. They somehow look like these models but there is much more second order effects that deteriorate the performance of these devices and the reason is that these transistors are basically built to have good digital performance. They are optimized for being fast, small and fast. They are not optimized for having good analog properties. And good analog properties is for instance the GM over GDS, the intrinsic gain that a single transistor gain stage can have. The other point is that more or less everything that is a constant in your basic transistor equations is not a constant in reality. The threshold voltage for instance is something that depends on the drain to source voltage. 
So it's not a constant. It will rise with your supplies. It more or less also will rise with your with your signal. It depends on the width and the length of the device. It depends on the bulk to source voltage. So this makes stuff much more complicated. And as everything is here optimized uh, for digital, it is more and more challenging to build analog circuits with these devices. It's possible, but it means effort and it, it means a sophisticated design. However, the basic challenge of combining analog and digital circuits is the following. You have a big digital block, and this digital block switches with a certain frequency. And the supply current consumed by this digital block is, let's say, several hundreds of milliamps. So let's take 500 milliamps. So then you can imagine that even with a very, very small resistor on your supply lines, this may cause a voltage drop of several tens of millivolts. Or this strong switching with each clock cycle, millions of gates switch synchronously with a certain clock cycle. Then this means a huge current spike resulting in a voltage peak more or less everywhere and resulting in injection of noise into the substrate. On the other hand, you have your analog devices and you want a high resolution. This means that in the analog domain, you deal with microvolts. Okay? So you have this big, heavily switching, strong device polluting more or less everything with noise. And then you have your small advanced sensitive device dealing with microvolts. And this is more or less contradictive. So you have the challenge to separate these two guys. To separate the analog domain from the digital domain by separating the supply, by uh, cleaning up the substrate and uh, stuff like this, so that these digital disturbers do not disturb your analog signal processing. And this is I guess one of the of the main challenges here in the in the integration of both dig digital and analog functionality. Okay. What questions do you have so far? Yes, please. Well, fast clocks in the question is why why we need fast clocks in analog uh, blocks. Well, um, we can, of course, we can sample faster if we have these clocks. However, usually the clock frequency is not the frequency that determines uh, the operations or the actions inside the analog block. Because assume that you sample uh, with a certain frequency and then you use 10 times the frequency to to organize any operations within the circuit. So for instance, the, the pipeline ADC. The pipeline ADC might uh, sample with, let's say, one megahertz, but internally it works with a much higher frequency because it has to uh, perform the conversion within several cycles. So candidate is successive approximation or is uh, is the pipeline ADCs where we let's say need 16 or 20 cycles to do this complete conversion, or if we uh, have some some digital correction blocks, then they also often run with a with a different frequency from the basic analog sampling frequency. So this is this is an ad advantage. Yeah, you're welcome. Other questions? Okay. So I will skip this. We discussed this several times before. And now I want to uh, come back uh, to the sampling process that you probably already know. But I want to start from this basic sampling process and want to move towards a variant of this that is more suitable for implementation. So assume that we have here our time continuous, value continuous analog signal 
and we want to sample this. So the signal processing guys tell you this is multiplying the analog signal with an impulse strain. So what does it mean? We say, okay, our sampled signal, xs, at a certain time, is the continuous signal, multiplied by a train of impulses. So we take the n from minus infinity to infinity over the delta function, t minus n t. Then you can say, okay, I can put this under the sum and I end up with the sum x delta t minus n t. So basically we have here the x t, but this is multiplied with the delta function, so you know the delta function is everywhere zero except at this single point where it occurs, so we can replace this t by the position where the delta function actually is, because all other positions are irrelevant, so we can write here x at the position n times t. t is the sampling frequency, t is the distance between these pulses, And for saving time during writing, we can also say this is a sum over all n's. And for x n t, we simply write x n, the x at the end sampling time, a uh, sampling point, times delta t minus n. Okay, and by doing this, you can see the pulse strain here is translated in a weighted pulse strain, so the output signal is still a pulse strain, but the amplitude of these pulses is weighted with the signal, with the analog signal value. Okay, then you know from the signal processing lectures that it is advantageous to use the Fourier transformation to describe signals and systems. So we can repeat this and say, yes, we know the Fourier transformation of a signal is x omega given by this integral from minus infinity to infinity over the signal in the time domain multiplied by e to the power of minus j omega t dt and we can go back into the time domain and say xt is 1 over 2 pi again an integral from minus infinity to infinity over x omega the spectral representation times e to the power of plus j omega t d omega. And what people in the analog world did, that they say, okay, we generalize this. And we say, or we introduce a new complex variable by replacing j omega by s. And then we end up with the Laplace transformation, which says x s is equal to an integral from minus infinity to infinity over x t e to the power of minus s t dt. This was the Laplace transformation. If you look at this, you can say, okay, here in these integrals, either in the Laplace integral or here in the Fourier formula, we have a continuous signal xt. So, on the previous slide, we had the sampled signal. So, how can we use the Fourier transformation or how can we translate this discrete time signal? 
And then there are books that say, okay, so for discrete time signals, you have a different formula. However, I want to show you that this is basically the same stuff, okay? So you don't have to learn other formulas for this. You can still use the Fourier transformation for this. And to understand this, we will insert this into this Fourier integral. So, therefore, we say x omega is equal to the integral of our x t e to the power of minus j omega t dt. And now we say x t is replaced by the sum over this weighted pulse strain, so sum over all n's x at the position n t, or x n, depends on what you prefer, times delta t minus n t. And then we exchange the order of the sum and the integral, so we put this sum out of the integral and we end up with a sum over all n's x n times the integral same boundaries e to the power of minus j omega t times delta t minus n t dt. So question for you guys, what is the integral of a function multiplied by a delta function? Hmm? Is it the same function? Is it really the function? The integral of the delta function is 1. But if we multiply a function with the delta, then we reduce this function to the value at the position of the delta function. And then we integrate and then your argument comes into the play that it's 1. So it's more or less the value of the function at the position where the delta is. So here we end up with the pen, a sum over all n's x n t e to the power of minus j omega and now the t is here the position of the delta function j omega n t and this is the Fourier transformation of a sampled signal So it's not a new transformation, it's basically the same, just inserted the signal. So in the digital world, people say, well, we have a PLL that generates a certain clock. And if this is once designed and the clock is not changed, <laughs> the information about this capital T is is not relevant because we, we know the clock frequency and we don't want to write this clock frequency in each formula. So they want to go to a representation where we say, okay, x n, where n is 1, 2, 3 and not 1t, 2t, 3t. So what people often do is that they normalize it, all these formulas, to the sampling frequency. And normalizing means that we say, okay, we introduce a new frequency omega, which is 2 pi f. This would be the small omega. And this is now normalized to the sampling frequency fs. Or we can write it in a different way and can say, okay, this is omega times t. This is a normalized frequency. Here we normalize 
sorry, we normalize the frequency. And if we normalize this frequency, then we can rewrite this and say, okay, x omega is equal to the sum over all n, x n, e to the power of minus j omega n. And now it li looks somehow different, and this is what people uh, call the Fourier transformation of a discrete sequence. But it is the Fourier transformation of a sampled signal with a normalization step. Nothing more. Okay? Just to save the time of writing here the T's all the time. An even more compact representation of this can be achieved if we generalize this in the, a similar way as we generalized uh, or have generalized the free transformation into the Laplace transformation for continuous signals. Here we can also generalize this by saying we take a new variable and this variable is C and this C is replacing the e to the power of j omega equal to e to the power of j omega capital T. And if we use this, then we have the x c equal to a sum over all n x n c to the power of minus n. And this is the c transformation. I apologize for <coughs> all these formulas and I promise this is only in the very first chapter that we have so much uh, free stuff and, and formula stuff. But we will use this indeed as a, as a tool if we discuss the oversampling converters because then we need the C transformation. And the C transformation is indeed the most suitable and popular uh, transformation in, in discrete signal processing and so also in, in this mixed signal field. Why is this? Well, it's a very compact way of writing this stuff but another uh, real uh, mathematical advantage is that it has much better convergence properties than the pure Fourier transformation. So an example is for instance this step function. If you have a step function where is complete, this is completely zero before the zero and it's completely one after the zero, so if you integrate over this, this will not converge in the Fourier integral. But with the C transformation it will because it is, is stamped. Okay, this is only a detail. Well, if we look at this, then I can say, okay, the reason is clear. We started from the Fourier transformation and ended up with a other transformation or other differently looking transformation for discrete signals. And the major step here was to say, okay, we normalize the frequency. So the question is, what is a normalized frequency? How can we understand this? What, what is this? If we look at the normal frequency, the omega, or in F, then it is clearly understood that this is the number of periods or oscillations with per second. Okay? So what is the capital omega? What does it mean? Well, let's look at these signals. You know, if we want to sample a signal, then we have to, as you uh, mentioned, we have to fulfill the Nyquist criterion. Yes. Okay. This means that s more than one or more than two samples occur within one period. Okay? So, if we look at this picture here, then we can see that we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 
15 samples per period. So one period is is corresponds to an angle of 2 pi. Okay? 1 is 2 pi. Now we have 16 samples within uh, this period. So one sample corresponds corresponds to 1 over 16 times 2 pi, which is 1 over 8 times pi. So the angular change from sample to sample is what is described by this normalized frequency, by this capital omega. So here we say we have an uh, angular frequency of pi over 8, which means that the angular change from sample to sample is this pi over 8. So if we increase the frequency here, you can see we have only eight samples per period. So we have this two pi. Mm. We have this two pi over eight samples, which means that we have pi over four. And angle per sample is expressed in, not angle per sample, but people say this is rat per sample, because this angular frequency has this pseudo uh, unit rat. So this is rat per sample. And then you can also check this for other frequencies here, for instance, where there is no signal at all. Of course, here also the normalized frequency is zero. Well, uh, at least for me, it is always a little bit more difficult to, to understand this, this uh, normalized frequency. But I hope this picture helps you to, to get a feeling what, what it actually is. Okay. So, let me go back one slide. We introduced a frequency domain transformation for a sampled signal. We understood now what this normalized frequency is. But what is interesting now is what actually happens to the spectrum of a sampled signal. How does it look like? And therefore, therefore I have to bother you once again with uh, some formulas. And we look at to the, into the frequency transformation a little bit more in detail. So you remember we multiplied the signal with a pulse train and this pulse train was a train of deltas, delta t minus n t. And this translates into the frequency domain into a signal that is also a pulse train. This is 2 pi over t a sum over delta omega minus k omega s. So pulse train in the time domain translates into a pulse train in the frequency domain and this omega s is basically the sampling frequency. So then we said we take our continuous time signal and we multiply this with the pulse train. So xc depending on t times st. And then you remember from your math and signal processing courses that the multiplication in the time domain translates into a convolution in the frequency domain. So we take the spectrum of the continuous time signal and fold it with the spectrum of the pulse train. Okay? And we can insert this and we see that this is 1 over t x c omega 
convolution with this pulse train in the frequency domain. Question for you guys. What is the convolution of a function with a delta function? Hmm? The same function? Exactly the same? The sum? Okay. Okay, we have the sum. I agree. But if we only take x, c, omega, folded delta omega minus, let's say, 5 omega s. At the frequency, the function shifted to the frequency of the delta. This is right. So we have here x, c, omega minus 5 omega s, right? And this is what we have to write down here. So we have 1 over t times the sum over all k x c omega minus k omega s. So sampling means that we copy and shift the basic spectrum of the signal to multiples of the sampling frequency. So we have a copy and shift. And we can look at, at this and this schematic here. You can see here we have a continuous signal. And this continuous signal has a band limited spectrum. And as soon as we sample this signal, we get copies of the original spectrum to multiples of the sampling frequency. Well, now it depends whether we use here the f or the omega, what values we write on the x-axis. So if we have the real frequency, then we have here really the sampling frequency. If we normalize this to the sampling frequency, then we have here 2 pi, 4 pi, and so on. So I, I give you always both for the because different books uh, use different uh, notations, so you are aware uh, that both exist and, and what to do. Okay, what you can see here is that as long as the sampling frequency is high enough, then these uh, mirror spectra are properly separated and you may use a filter to filter one of these out. Then you know if the sampling frequency is too small, then they overlap and we have an effect that is called aliasing. In this course, I prefer to give you a time domain uh, impression of what uh, what aliasing means okay you can imagine if this overlaps then you cannot reconstruct it let me go uh, quickly a couple of slides ahead here you can see if i have the first situation here i can filter out the signal properly well in the second version i still can filter out the signal properly uh, well my filter is a little bit m harder to implement because uh, it has to be very sharp in between these pulses if they are really nearby, but it, it may work. In the third case here, we have really an overlap. So we have one version here, we have the second version or the shifted version here. So you can see here in this region they overlap and if I filter this out with the same filter as in the previous case then I get a spectrum that looks really different. So let me go back here. I want to show you in the time domain why this Nyquist criterion is really important. Look at this sign signal and we sample it with a rate of one. OK, 
okay, this is just, just numbers. This is a normalized sampling rate of one. Then we get these red points. Then we say, let's increase the frequency, and the new frequency is the or original one, which was 0.22, plus, now we take plus the sampling frequency. So this is our old frequency, and together with this, this is the new frequency. Then we still have a sign, and we can sample this with the same rate, and we get this red point. Now I take these two falls and put them on top of each other. And you can see here, it's the same points for both for the fast oscillation and for the slow oscillation. Okay? If you have one of these foils, then you can say, okay, this is the signal corresponding to these sampling points. But the problem occurs if you have only the sampling points. If I give you only the sampling points, on exam question, for instance, uh, what is the signal that leads to the sampling points, or how do you reconstruct the signal? Let's, let's assume I ask how to reconstruct the signal. Well, what is the solution? The black one or the blue one? Or even another one that has an, an even higher frequency? So this is not possible anymore, okay? So for sampling, the request is that you always have to fulfill the Nyquist frequency uh, or criterion, otherwise you, you fail with converting this back. And this is uh, or should give you an impression what happens in the time domain if you have this situation. Okay, so far I repeated what you already know from your signal processing lectures. So what's wrong with all of this? Who has built an analog circuit before? Nobody, I can't believe this. Usually people study uh, study electrical engineering because they like to build circuits. Okay. Then, question would be, how to implement an impulse? What would you do? What is the characteristic of an impulse? This you should know. What is the characteristic of an impulse? How wide is it? It's infinitely narrow. And the height is infinitely high. So it's infinitely narrow. If you integrate over it, you get one. So it has to be infinitely high. So infinitely narrow is something that is quite hard to implement. OK? <laughs> More or less, it's, it's impossible to implement. So each signal, each signal, has a finite slope. It has a finite pulse width. Why do we need a finite, or do we always have a finite pulse width? What is the physical background of this? Band is limited, yes. So we can say we have a finite bandwidth here. And the point is, if you implement something, you have at least a piece of wire. Even if you do not connect any device to this, you have at least a piece of wire. And independently, the small it is, it always has a certain capacitance. And to change a voltage on a node, or to change the voltage of this piece of wire, we have to charge this cap. And if we had a step, or if we had an infinitely narrow pulse, then it means that we have to charge and discharge this cap within no time, which would require an infinite current. Okay, and then you end up, you, you see the problem. Infinite current, how, how to realize. Even if we could realize it, it would probably damage our system. The same is with the height. A voltage representing this impulse that is infin infinitely high. Okay. Even if we could implement this, then we would just implement a small flash and then system dead. Okay. So this is basically not 
not possible. So we also have here a finite value. So if we talk about sampling, which is in the ideal theory, something like this, then this is something that is very valuable for developing all these signal processing algorithms and to develop the theory and, yes, more or less algorithms. However, if we talk about circuits, then this is not, this ideal sampling is not realistic. We will have something that looks like this. We have here pulses. Or what we see even more often is that we have a so-called sample and hold. So this was pulse sampling, by the way. And now we talk about this sample and hold. Ho sample and hold means that we sample the signal, so we step to the value, and then we keep it constant for one period. Then new clock arrives, we sample the signal again and keep it constant for the next one. And then we end up with a step function like this. Oops, sorry. Why is this reasonable to have a function like this or a sampling process like this? Yes, because of these reasons, okay? Because we can we simply cannot implement an impulse. That's the point here. And the other good thing with the third solution is assume that we have a ADC that takes some time for the conversion. We discussed it before and say okay, why do we ha need several clocks? Well, because it takes several iterations in most ADCs to convert the signal. So it takes time to quantize the signal. So we sample the signal, we keep it constant to give the ADC the time to convert. If the signal would change while the, the ADC converts, then pff, we uh, would get something in between, okay? There is, there is one class of ADC that can accept this, but usually we m sample it, hold the signal constant, run the conversion algorithm, then we sample the next, the next signal. Okay, so this is what we had at the very beginning. In reality, we do not have these ideal impulses, but we have this, or if the pulse width here is as wide as the sampling time, then we have this. So in reality, we have no this ideal sampling process followed by a filter. So here we have the continuous signal. Here we have the impulse train. Here we have the weighted impulse train. Okay, this is our signal. Here we have the weighted impulses. And here we have a filter that has an impulse response, H, T, that is such a rectangular signal. So this is the impulse response of this filter. So we do the ideal sampling virtually in our heads, okay? Then we get these weighted samples and out of each weighted sample we make 
a pulse that has a finite high and has a finite duration, but in the integral it corresponds to what we have with the ideal sampling. Michael will do this in the exercise or in the sorry in the in the tutorials. So he will go through this sampling process with you and you will see what changes in these formulas of the ideal sampling. I hope you do this, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and great. And there you will see that as it is shown here in this diagram, we have the ideal sampling. You will recognize this in the formulas and you will then see that there is this filter after the ideal sampling which is the multi in the frequency domain a multiplication that deteriorates the spectrum of the sampled signal. So here on this slide this will done in the tutorials Here you will really exercise this calculation and sorry for that Michael, I will present the result of your work. <laughs> um, this is what we had before. We have seen if we do the ideal sampling then we have here out of the original spectrum we have these copies of the spectrum and of course the keeping the pulse width finite has an impact on the spectrum. And you will see that these rectangular signals will cause a sink in the frequency domain. So you multiply this, you multiply this by something that looks like this. Okay, it's now it's two, 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 two. Okay, I have to I have to check this. You multiply it by something like this. Okay? So at the very end if you take the track and hold like we did it here, you do not get the original spectrum copied to multiples of the of the sampling frequency, but you will get damped versions of the copies. Last question for today. Is this an issue? What we did in theory is this. Copy. Co let me delete the blue thing again that we see. What we. Th all the theory and algorithm development is based on this. And now we implement something that will result in this. I will show you the implementation of this sampling next week. So pr I promise we will implement this. And for sure it is different. Do you think this is a problem? Is it, a, let's, is it an issue for an ADC? You do not agree. Why not? You're right. You're right. If it okay, you get, you might say if it would be a big deal, then we wouldn't do it like this. Yeah, but it's actually not a problem. Have, do you have an idea why? The point is, yes. Okay, you get, you you propose that you you filter it. Yes. Well, the point is in the ADC, we do the conversion and then we give a single digital value to the digital signal processor. Okay? Also, we implement it. We implement the sample and hold like this. This does not mean that we give here lots of samples to the digital domain, but what we indeed give to the digital domain is one sample here, one sample here, one sample here. So for in the digital domain it looks again perfect. However, in the other direction, if we go from the digital to the analog, then we take these perfect samples and make pulses out of them. And then the pulse width indeed has an impact 
on the analog signal. Okay, you might say we filter out these, these components anyhow. Yes, that's right. But of course, there is some distortion already here in, in this band. And this is what becomes visible if I go into the or back into the analog domain. Okay, so we, this is something we have to keep in mind that uh, it may dit uh, distort the signal. Okay, let's close here for today. Do you have any questions so far? Okay, I have to apologize for all the, the chaos at the beginning. <laughs> Not so much fun, uh, but yeah, the rest, the rest of the course was. So thanks a lot for attending. I also have to apologize that we had so much theory uh, in this very first lecture, but I promise starting from next week on, we will uh, only discuss circuits and circuit-related details. So I hope to see you back next week with the implementation-related stuff. Thanks a lot and have a good week. <laughs>